Today we are excited to hear from Clint Crable, Animal Science Department Head here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Prior to his time here at UNL, Dr. Crable served in the role of Regents Professor of Animal Science and Dennis and Marta White Endowed Chair in Animal or Ruminant Nutrition and Health at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Crable's research interests focus on developing methods to reduce cost of production and optimize outputs that enable cattle producers to improve animal health, increase consistency and quality of their end product, and become more profitable. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Crable. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. I uh, really, really want to thank Brent and Aaron. Great job, really good calf health management webinar series. Doctors Groves and Thompson really did a nice job uh, setting the stage about best practices for receiving cattle and health protocols and how we handle those cattle on arrival. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, today or switch gears a little bit with regard to how nutrition impacts health management decision for receiving care. So if you think about all of the um, items that we put calves through, both pre-weaning and post-weaning, it's pretty extensive uh, in terms of the list. So factors that impact immunity and feedlot health and carcass quality. Before weaning, we, uh, we have research related to cow nutrition and its impact on uh, subsequent calf growth and, and uh, carcass quality the importance of claustrum intake. Uh, Dan talked a lot about uh, BBDB, uh, especially those calves that are persistently infected with that virus. Pre-weaning health, so if those calves go under stress or get sick prior to weaning, and then of course how we manage those calves from the time of weaning until we ship those animals. And then post-weaning, which is where we focus a lot of our time in this series, uh, transportation, the way those cattle are co-mingled when they're purchased. And again, uh, Dr. Groves really did a nice job of talking about decreasing stress related to co-mingling. Uh, receiving management or management protocols that Dr. Thompson talked about. And uh, today I'll talk about uh, the receiving diet. We'll talk a lot about metaphylaxis, but of course, uh, Dan did mention that last week. So again, if you think about what a calf goes through from birth until it goes on to the next stage of life, uh, whether that's in a, in a grazing environment or in a stalker type of op uh, operation or into a backgrounding yard or to a feedlot, uh, before weaning, that environment includes the calf nursing, typically on grass, so in a grazing scenario, the source of water would typically, in that environment at least, on a ranch be from a pond or from a tank. Uh, and the social dominance, the order that that calf uh, gains from a social perspective is a function of that calf's mother. At weaning time, obviously we separate the dam from the calf. Uh, we expose those calves to a new way of getting feed and uh, to to uh, different feed sources, often, not always, but often. Uh, the way they get water could be different. If we think about from a pond or a tank in a pasture to a water herb, and of course, they have to reestablish their, their own social dominance or own pecking order, if you will, uh, among that group of calves. So if you think about the abruptness of, of the weaning process, if we wean calves on the truck, we are asking a lot uh, from those calves. So really lots of good information and a lot of good data on those management practice all the way through the scenario I just described. Uh, a lot of information on best methods for weaning calves. Not going to spend a lot of time there, but we'll uh, kind of give a summary. Preconditioning, uh, in my mind, and I was really happy to hear Dan mention that last week. If, if there was if there was one practice that our industry would implement in our beef cattle systems that would have the greatest impact, 
on calf health at arrival in the feed yard, it would be preconditioning. And I'll show you a little data to that regard. Of course, vaccinations, castration and dehorning, uh, transportation, critically important, how we uh, receive and process those calves on arrival, and then nutrition and handling. All of that is really uh, methods or management practices to manage stress. And so stress is any demand that we place on the body uh, that, that uh, causes a response from the animal. So if you think about uh, an extreme adjustment like weaning or weaning on the truck can create, ultimately it changes the physiology of that animal. So we wean calves, we change their social order, uh, just like sending our kids to pre-K or to kindergarten when they're figuring that whole social order out, um, or maybe sending them to college for the first time, putting them in a new environment. That social disruption changes the psychology of the animal, which results in a physiological response. And the same thing happens in cattle. So really, the, uh, the handling aspects that Dan talked about last week, the importance of proper husbandry, if you will, is all about redu reducing or decreasing the stress on the calf. And that's around weaning, commingling, environment, handling, nutrition, and of course, people stressors uh, in the way that we manage those calves at weaning and post weaning we ought to always be thinking about how that calf is going to respond from a stress standpoint. And if we can minimize stress of those calves, uh, plenty of evidence to show that we'll decrease the clinical disease risk and enhance performance and carcass merit. So this is a, again a bit redundant uh, with the, the previous two talks, just to make the point that a lot of new drugs have come on the market. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, management practices, et cetera, and it still seems like, uh, well, it doesn't seem like, the data would suggest that the mortalities in feed yards is continuing to increase. Uh, 2013 was a long time ago already, but I have seen more recent summaries of this data that suggest that trend continues uh, or might be beginning to plateau, but the timing of those feedlot deaths is changing, and, uh, and I believe Brian will address that next week. And then if we think about the mortalities by cause, right, respiratory disease, and this is even, even older data by uh, Guy Lonergan, uh, but respiratory disease, or BRD, continues to be the, least, the leading uh, cause of death uh, in, uh, in feedlots. So this is NOMS data, and I know uh, NOMS is trying to, uh, they, they are trying to get the survey out, and I think they got delayed because of COVID. So the intent was to do an update of this in 2020. I believe it's been pushed back to 2021. But this is interesting. And so uh, what I'm showing here is from an industry perspective, from a feedlot producer perspective, what they feel are the greatest challenges of receiving calves. In the, uh, in the first, uh, within parentheses, the first percentage there is 2011, and the uh, percentage beside it is data from 2009. So it's interesting in 2011 that castration dehorning four weeks prior to shipment was perceived uh, as the most important factor that would improve health outcomes of calves uh, upon uh, arrival at a feed yard. Second was BRD vaccine, two weeks prior to weaning. Having exposure to a feed bunk was third. BRD vaccines at weaning was fourth. Just weaning itself ranked fifth, and internal, external deworming uh, ranked sixth. Interesting again that, that just two years prior, of course that data would, would have been collected prior to that, uh, that just weaning, just wean the calf uh, was considered the greatest management uh, that would help feedlot operators in terms of health outcomes for calves upon arrival. 
So if we think about how calves are actually weaned or the, the weaning strategy to, to decrease risk, uh, I, I've looked at a lot of information. There's a lot of good papers out there from 2003 to 2016. Of course, that's, that's a select, that doesn't exhaust the literature available. And, and essentially, certainly the, uh, the stress response can vary depending on how we wean calves. But ultimately, there's very limited impact on performance or calf health if you look at that across the 28 to 70 day period. So I just reiterate here the importance of thinking about the way we manage calves through the weaning process and every process subsequent to weaning to make sure that we are to the greatest extent possible decreasing stress on that calf. Again, I believe the, the, the greatest opportunity to improve health outcomes of calves uh, prior to receiving in a feedlot is preconditioning. Okay, and, and I'm gonna be selfish and, and share some of our data, but there's other, certainly other data that support this. So it's not really managing the stress per se, but management of the cause of stress or managing cattle to decrease or remove the stress and preconditioning uh, de decreases uh, weaning and shipping stress. So what, what do we see in general across the board about having calves broke to a bunk, if you will, prior to weaning? Gains are increased, intakes are increased, gain efficiency or feed efficiency is better, there's a reduction in morbidity, It'll actually increase your cost of gain if you look at it across the, again, a short time, a short uh, window frame. Uh, again, because those cattle are eating more, right? Relative to their gain, they're gonna eat more. But again, the health outcomes related to decreased morbidity uh, certainly offsets the increase in the cost of gain. A lot of times we don't, uh, and, and Dan did a really nice job talking about uh, you know, why our industry hasn't evolved more towards preconditioning program, of course cost, who's paying for it, right, is a big part of that discussion, and then lack of facilities to, uh, to go through a preconditioning program or two major items that you hear about when you have those discussions. Um, but again, there are quantified changes that are observed if, if indeed we would go to a preconditioning strategy to wean calves. Uh, so this is, a, this is a study we did and, and Dr. D.L. Stepp was a colleague of mine at Oklahoma State. So you don't, you don't get very many signature papers in a career. Uh, this, this is one that uh, I, I believe is, is mine or Dr. Stepp's and mine. So, what we did is we, we found a ranch in Arkansas who agreed to work with us and had enough calves where they could ranch wean and ship immediately uh, or just wean, just wean the calves for 45 days, no vaccines, and then send them to us or go through a VAC 45 program, standard protocol, and then ship the calves to us. And now we bought some, uh, we bought some sale barn calves and, and I've gotten real sensitive about that term because the only time I've been called into the dean's office as a scientist is uh, when I got a little negative uh, around the sale barn and uh, <laughs> the wrong people were, were in the audience and, and it ultimately resulted in a, in a trip to the dean's office for me. Uh, again, there is definitely a place and, and very important place uh, for, for sale barns or, or auction markets. Uh, and of course, we see the importance and the value of that across the state like Nebraska. But just, just to point out, if we sourced uh, market calves from, again, from an auction versus ranch wean, we didn't, we didn't see any difference in morbidity, albeit the, uh, at least numerically, the, uh, the um, uh, overall first time treats were greater Again, holistically, and I, I just need to talk about the statistics, there were no difference. But look at, look at the wean 45 and the back 45. So just weaning those calves, okay, even without a vaccination program, dramatically decreased our overall morbidity, 
uh, in those steers upon arrival. And of course, when we think about case fatality rates, those deaths that were associated with BRD uh, only occurred in the, in the auction market cabs uh, with no deaths associated with uh, BRD in the ranch cabs, whether they were, whether they were weaned on the truck uh, or weaned for 45 days or, or went through a back 45 program. So this is a performance data and uh, didn't quite have enough power to, to pull out differences in dry matter intake, but I'll point you there first. We had a pound greater dry matter intake overall in the ranch calves. Those cattle gained better and were more efficient, again, across the 42 days. And if we co-mingled ranch and sale barn calves in every category, whether we're talking about performance or morbidity, uh, those cattle fell uh, in between the, the the sale barn and the ranch calves. So obviously, if you look at the economics of that, uh, even considering all the vaccines that, that occurred either at the ranch or on arrival at the feed yard, you know, it's between a four and five dollar cost saving per head. And uh, so then the question becomes, looking at the overall economic picture, what the value of that is at the, at the actual feed lot trickling that back down to what, uh, what the uh, rancher or farmer that's weaning those calves and going through a back 45 on the farm might get paid uh, for, for going through those kinds of programs. So again, I'm just arguing that the, that the single greatest positive impact we could have on our industry from a health outcome standpoint is, uh, is preconditioning calves. Okay, regardless of whether calves are preconditioned or not, when we get those calves to, um, to the feed yard or to the next phase uh, of their life, the things that we should think about in terms of a receiving program are, are first optimizing conditions from promoting health and nutrition. Again, Dan did a great job, uh, again, talking about pen maintenance, talking about uh, hospital pens, if, if indeed we have those pens talking about keeping pens clean and how we might bed those pens to, uh, to promote health uh, of those calves on arrival. Um, minimizing the risk of disease and digestive disorders during the receiving phase, critically important. So again, starting to think about how we might formulate diets uh, to meet the, the nutrient needs of those calves. And then we think about what our target weight is for the cattle and how we're gonna get them there and doing that at a least cost. So Galen Erickson and I uh, both had the opportunity to serve on the, uh, the new NRC committee. Most of us would know it as the NRC, now, uh, now NASM, for uh, the, the, uh, the latest volume of that came out in 2016. And in the summary chapter that we wrote, based on the literature that we have to date, or at least to that point, there's, there's really not a strong argument that nutrient requirements per se are different for stress calves than they are for non-stress calves, okay? But I'll talk, I'll talk more about the differences here as we go forward. The only real exception to that is, is vitamin E, and there's quite a bit of literature on vitamin E suggesting that the requirements for vitamin E are higher for a stress calf than they are for a non-stress calf. So one, uh, one of the things that, that you can measure uh, on arrival is uh, inflammatory markers, okay? So this, this uh, gets a little fundamental. What, what we did though is we exposed some calves to BBD, to, to a PI calf, and then we challenged them intertracheally with Mannheimia hemolytica, one of the pathogens of BRD. Okay, and, and then we just, uh, of course, looked at rectal temperature to make sure our model was working if we could get those calves to spike a temperature. And then we looked at the inflammatory markers of the bovine respiratory disease. One of the markers uh, that's produced by the liver, at least predominantly by the liver, uh, is a protein called haptoglobin. And, and what you can see from this figure is that calves spike the temperature and then liver haptoglobin concentrations increased and actually remained elevated 
this should be uh, hours instead of days, but remained elevated uh, for out to four days uh, in these calves that we challenged. Okay, so making again making the argument that there's no difference in requirements for nutrients in cattle that that are stressed or ultimately have to mount an immune response uh, may not be exactly so. In other words, you know it, it's difficult to measure at a pen level, but but when you think about how nutrients have to be repartitioned because the priorities for that animal change from growth, which is what we, we want those animals to do. We want those animals to come in, start consuming nutrients uh, and, and uh, get started on a growth pattern. Instead, they're fighting off this, this inflammation. They're fighting off these pathogens. Again, both John and Dan talking uh, or relating that to COVID, right? And, and what our bodies have to go through if indeed we get a viral infection. Same, same for those animals. And I'm just showing, uh, this, is, this is liver removal of amino acids. So think about a calf consuming a diet that we formulate, formulate to meet their nutrient requirements. Uh, and now, because they have inflammation related to a bacterial, in this case, pathogen associated with BRD, their liver is not producing uh, nutrients to promote growth their liver is producing proteins to help fight the, the inflammation. And so we just looked at the removal of amino acids by the liver, and you can see that essential and non-essential amino acids and total amino acids, the removal of those by the liver uh, is greatly increased when calves have to mount an immune response. So we might not see the change uh, in, in uh, total nutrient requirements, at least in a short period of time, but indeed the partitioning or the way that animal uses those nutrients is greatly impacted when they undergo uh, inflammation or stress related to, to inflammation. So we, we just uh, did another study where we looked at that inflammatory marker, the haptoglobin, and we broke it into low concentrations, medium concentrations, or high concentrations on arrival Okay, and you can, you can see from, again, this figure, this graph, that uh, those animals that came in with lower inflammation, or at least a marker of inflammation, right, they consume more feed. Dan talked about eating one and a half percent of body weight uh, in dry matter by a week and a half uh, post-arrival, okay? And so we see, uh, again, that the lower the inflammation, the more quickly those calves were able to hit that one and a half percent of body weight mark from the perspective of dry matter intake. And of course, inversely then, if we see a greater dry matter intake, we see a lower to total morbidity uh, in those, those animals that aren't challenged with inflammation when they arrive in the feed yard. So there's been a lot of uh, really good work. A lot of this work is getting dated already. Uh, and, and so looking forward to, to technologies that we're talking about uh, at NREC here that allow us to pen feed animals, but get individual animal intake. Uh, and, and so we're, we're moving in that direction. But Mike Gallion has, has done a lot of work in the, in the feedlot intake or feed cattle, feedlot cattle intake space um, and uh, says speed intake is the single most important driving force affecting production of feedlot cattle and demonstrated that in a 1995 review. Again, if cattle are not stressed, they consume feed in quantities sufficient to maintain adequate energy intake. And so, um, you know, we have the whole energy versus fill effect if we're feeding a low quality forage animals are gonna to try to eat to their energy requirement, but fill prohibits them from consuming enough energy, but in a higher energy diet, uh, they can consume feed to meet that uh, energy intake requirement. The challenge is, it's, that's well established, is if, if calves are uh, stressed, so even on arrival, uh, especially then if they're undergoing a, uh, inflammation such as bovine respiratory disease, 
it can decrease feed intake by 50%. And getting that back to quote unquote normal can take more uh, than, than two weeks. So that's a real challenge with receiving new calves in general, newly weaned calves in general, but certainly if we have a disease outbreak uh, and we're having to, uh, to fight uh, off inflammation. So the challenge with calves, again, whether, whether they're healthy on arrival uh, or whether they're stressed or undergoing an uh, inflammation on arrival is that it's difficult to meet their nutrient requirement because they takes them a while to get established on feed. And so really, even though nutrient requirements per se aren't different, right, the greatest challenge for these for these calves on arrival uh, is getting them to consume enough nutrients to meet their nutrient requirements. So this is a classic work by Hutchison and Cole. Uh, so a lot, a lot of you I'm sure have seen this data, maybe at nauseum, but they, they uh, just took uh, newly arrived calves and, and just measure, measured dry matter intake across a 56 day period and then they broke it out into uh, weeks. Uh, so looking at day zero to seven, so one week, two, one week, two weeks, four weeks, uh, or out to 56 days. And then they looked at uh, the healthy calves, the calves that they never pulled and treated for clinical signs of respiratory disease or animals that they did pull and treat for respiratory disease. And it, it does a really nice job of demonstrating what I'm talking about with regard to the fact that in healthy calves, uh, right, you might get them to one and a half percent body weight depending again on, on a lot of factors prior to shipping those calves. But if those calves get sick, getting them to that one and a half percent body weight intake is really difficult, okay? And so if we think about uh, even 2% body weight in terms of dry matter intake, uh, those calves that got sick in this study didn't achieve 2% even out to, to 28 days. So, so certainly, again, feed intake is a real challenge uh, and, and a need that those calves have with regard to getting the nutrients that they require to, uh, first of all, to fight off inflammation and then subsequently to, uh, to start growth. Galen shared this information with me. It, it again, demonstrates the same thing. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that. Just, just a summary of data in the first 28 days from calves that they have received. So week one, week two, week three, week four, and then across the 28 day period. Again, just looking at the, as a percent of body weight within the, within the first two weeks, right? Uh, those, those calves were still consuming under 2% of their body weight on a, on a dry matter basis. So again, it took uh, three weeks for them to, uh, to achieve close to two and a half percent of body weight in terms of intake. So the other thing we, we might often not think about is the fact is that when we look at pen level data, we often assume that all the animals are consuming feed. And uh, this data from, again, from Hutchison 1980 shows that that's probably not the case, right? And, and so, in, in this study, only 21% of the calves were eating feed on day one, okay? And really, they didn't get to close to 70% of the calves or 70% of the calves consuming feed uh, for a week. So at day 70, they were able to measure that 70% of the calves that were newly received at the feed yard had consumed feed. So again, Calves are tricky, uh, as, as we've learned the last couple of weeks, and, and so observation is critically important, not just that they might be at the bunk, but that they're actually consuming feed. Glenn Lofgreen, who was at, uh, originally at UC Davis, but uh, did a lot of really neat work in, in this, the, uh, the uh, area of high-risk calves while he was at the Clayton Livestock uh, Research Center at Clayton, New Mexico. You know, he did some voluntary intake work, uh, which was which is really interesting. And so, basically, he, he fed diets of roughage only or some concentrate, 
and he noted that in stress cattle, uh, voluntary intake of high roughage diets, which is really counterintuitive to what we might think, is actually less than that of a high energy diet. So, so in the diets he formulated, right, just given free choice, the stress calf selected diets with 72% concentrate in the first week after arrival. So if you think about our previous conversation, that kind of makes sense, right? If calves are trying to eat to meet their energy requirement, it makes sense that they might select a higher energy diet as opposed to a really high roughage diet, uh, where indeed they might get full before they actually meet their, their energy need. So this is uh, just some of his data uh, where he fed only hay. Okay, or he fed a 75% concentrate either uh, alone, so the concentrate diet alone, uh, or a mixture of the milled ration and some hay. And again, with the concentrate, uh, those animals ate more pounds of intake, which, which suggests that, uh, that Phil was restricting energy intake in the calves that received the hay only. Obviously, just looking at performance, right? Daily gain, feed gain, uh, much greater, much better in, uh, in the calves that received some uh, concentrate diet, or in this case, a 75% concentrate diet. So if you, if you look at then uh, the, uh, the death loss and the treats and retreats, that's where the discussion gets kind of interesting, okay? And, and we continue to, be, to debate and, and, and study uh, this concept of calves will, will go to a higher energy diet, they need a higher energy diet to meet their nutrient requirements, but what, what this data shows uh, is that the percent treated, the percent animals treated, right, is, is, is greater, and the animals that get a second treatment, pulled and treated a second time, is greater, even though performance and cost of gain are, are, are also much better, okay? So you're getting greater performance out of those animals, uh, but indeed, and this has been fairly consistent, that you might be pulling and treating uh, more of those calves. Galen, again, shared a, a really nice uh, summary with me uh, from, from uh, uh, Bremer, 2007 Nebraska Beef Cattle Report. So they had uh, uh, two-thirds sale barn, one-third ranch direct calves that were, they were allocated either to a feedlot at receiving or to pasture at receiving. Okay, and then they, they just broke this into animals treated for respiratory illness, pink eye, foot raw, total death loss. And uh, similar to what Glenn showed, right, they had a lot more pulls for respiratory disease for cattle that they adapted uh, or received in the feedlot. And they looked at that at, at 28 or, or 42 days. From a, from a performance perspective, okay, so these were five weight calves, five and a half weight calves. Uh, look, at, look at the performance. So similar to the loft green data, much better performance in the feedlot relative to pasture. But again, the incidence of BRD was greater in the feedlot than, uh, than on pasture. We did, a, we did an experiment uh, at, at Oklahoma State, uh, again, to try to get at this concept. These were uh, six weight cattle. And uh, in a 60 day backgrounding experiment, and those cattle were sourced from Florida, Missouri, Oklahoma, and, and Texas. And what we did is a traditional adaptation program. So on arrival, we stepped those calves up on weekly intervals from 64, 72, 80. And then we, we targeted a two and a half pound per day rate of gain. Um, and so we, we restricted those, those calves uh, at, uh, with 88% concentrate uh, for a targeted 2.5 uh, average daily gain. The, the, the other approach we took was just to feed the 64% concentrate diet for 28 days, and then we follow those animals up with this step up. So this just shows again what I just described, either feeding cattle for 28 days, a 64% concentrate diet ad libitum, 
or taking them to 88% concentrate uh, in three weeks and then holding them. Uh, just showing you, again, this little problem with this study and that in our, in our restriction, we didn't, try, we didn't quite hit our target at two and a half pounds per day, but it shows the same thing with regard to morbidity, which is my point, uh, that the faster we took those animals up, uh, the greater the percent of morbidity uh, in those calves. Okay, so just from an intake standpoint, it seems that certainly performance is better. If we feed a 60% or greater concentrate diet, uh, one possible negative aspect is increased morbidity rate. Okay, one thing we've really worked, started working on before I, uh, before I left Oklahoma State was, was are, we really, are we really pulling for BRD or is this acidosis? Okay, is this room of acidosis that we're missing? Some of the clinical signs would be similar, right? So how many of these papers are really looking at, at clinical signs of BRD versus clinical signs of acidosis? Certainly, and, and I'll just reiterate what Dan said about the importance of good quality hay early in the receiving period, predominantly so that calves can find the bunk. Uh, and probably the, the most important takeaway from that study that uh, Ben Holland and I did uh, is that in high risk calves, giving the most susceptible calves time to get adapted is critically important, I believe, from a morbidity standpoint prior to uh, increasing the level of concentrate or stepping those animals up on feed. This is just that Hutchison and Cole data that, that indicates knowing the risk category of calves on arrival is important, right? So we might adapt ranch origin calves, certainly if they've been uh, weaned for 45 days, we might be able to move them a little more aggressively than we could higher risk category calves that are, that are sourced from unknown sources. Real quickly here, because uh, I, I want to make sure uh, I don't go over uh, with regard to time. Just want to want to talk a little bit about uh, crude, uh, crude protein, and so just use this illustration again from from NRC 2016. If you have a 500 pound steer that's gaining 2.2 pounds per day, uh, according to NRC, the crude protein requirement is is uh, 1.4 pounds per day. Okay. If intake is compromised in stressed calves, we'd have to feed 19% crude protein on arrival uh, in order to meet those pounds of crude protein that that calf requires. The best data that really illustrates that is from Floridian Lurch from Ohio State. This again, older data in, in 1995. Um, just showing, again, thinking about 1.4 pounds of crude protein, they, they fed 12, 14, 16, or 18 percent protein diets, okay? And, and pounds of crude protein intake, right, didn't hit the, the 1.4 pound or meet their, meet their requirement until the 14 percent diet was fed in the second week. Certainly though, those calves you can see from, I'll show you here from performance in terms of gain and feed efficiency responded to the increasing concentrations of protein. Okay, so again, concentrating that nutrient for the receiving period, at least for the first two weeks was beneficial with regard to performance. One thing I'm not showing is that they, they saw the same result with regard to morbidity. So uh, their pulls and treats were greater with the higher protein, the higher percent of protein diets. And these were in 540 pounds steers. Real quickly, uh, data on vitamins and minerals, mostly non-conclusive with regard to uh, shipping stress calves or, or high-risk calves on arrival. We know which minerals are important from an immunocompetence standpoint. And so again, considering concentrating those minerals uh, is important. This is old data, but there's been a renewed interest in chromium. And, and so 
this is an early study again with some five weight calves that showed uh, 0.2 part per million of chromium resulted in greater dry matter intake and, and no morbidity uh, in a titration study. Challenge with this experiment, of course, they only had 21 calves per treatment, so really low numbers. But again, there is a, there is a renewed interest in some of these micro minerals uh, from, a, uh, from a health standpoint in receiving calves. But I'll just, I'll just say here that the requirement is similar, at least uh, what we know today for stressed and non-stressed calves. I mentioned vitamin E, right? And there's, there's uh, more recent data uh, in vitamin E with, uh, with vitamin E concentration. So we've recommended four to 500 international units per day for newly received calves. Again, vitamin E is involved in a whole lot of uh, capacities with regard to being an antioxidant, right? Uh, cell structure and function, uh, muscle. And, and so uh, a lot of information with regard to the importance of uh, vitamin E, particularly as, as an antioxidant. So again, stress-related animals and decreasing uh, inflammation uh, certainly vitamin E could potentially play a role there. Dan, I was also uh, glad to hear Dan kind of support my bias with regard to ancillary therapies. We've done some work with ancillary therapies and, and it's really non-conclusive, okay? Some studies you'll get a response, some studies you don't. Uh, and the Academy of Veterinary Consultants have come out to say there's really no evidence for the value of ancillary therapies uh, in receiving protocols. I'm sure some of you will, uh, will disagree with that statement. So what, what's important then is, is really in the first two weeks post arrival is consider concentrating nutrients in order to compensate for the fact that, that uh, these calves uh, are gonna take a little while to get adapted to be able to, uh, to consume um, uh, feed intake at a level that meets their nutrient requirements. A few other considerations here in a, in a little time left. Uh, Dan showed a water tank that was really nasty, okay, in, in, a, in a career managing a research feed yard at Oklahoma State. We had an opportunity to train a lot of undergraduate students because the yard was literally two miles from campus. And every time a student would, would come to the office and say such and such pen is totally off feed or, or the manager calling feed in the morning would tell me the same thing. The first question was what, right? Did you check the water? And I, I, would, I would venture to guess that uh, probably 60 to 70% of the time, right? Uh, a steer had defecated in small pen research, had defecated in the water and the cattle didn't want to drink it. Uh, and so keeping water clean is critically important. Making sure you understand what minerals are coming through the source of water uh, is critically important. And, and certainly water intake is related to dry matter intake or feed intake. Uh, and so really, really important consideration. Again, the number, the number one, the, the most important nutrient really that we can consider. Dan talked about this, so I don't need to, to reiterate it long. You know, if, if you have newly weaned calves that, that you purchased again, uh, unsourced through a, through a sale barn, and those calves come, come from a ranch, they might be ranch calves, might probably uh, really, really good calves, but they may not have any experience with the bunk. So, so feeding good quality hay on the apron, uh, and then maneuvering those calves so that they find that hay, and gradually find the hay in the feed bunk is critically important. Just a rule of thumb, you know, a half to 1% of body weight of concentrate and one to one and a half percent of body weight hay until we get those calves, those naive calves up to one and a half percent body weight. And, and eventually they're gonna find the feed and they're gonna go to the feed and that's, that's exactly what we want. And, and I would say not only identifying calves that don't come to the bunk, but even the, the calves that may try to trick you and, and they'll be at the bunk, but they're really not eating, critically important for pen riders to be able to observe and identify those calves. 
So nutrient requirements, generally the same for stressed and non-stressed cattle, but feed intake on arrival, plenty of data to indicate it, it's compromised. Uh, and, and so making sure we're formulating diets to meet the nutrient needs of the animal is critically important. And of course, our top priority after we help those calves find the water is to help them find the feed in the feed bunk. There, many of you know uh, Jerry Stutka and uh, read, a, read a recent paper of his. He's a stewardship veterinarian at North Dakota State University. And, and we know this, and I know as uh, someone that grew up in the industry and knowing a lot of cattle producers, we believe this and really need to tell our story. But really, what do we care about? We care about giving our farm, our ranch to the next generation, right? So, so and, and we're, we're entrusted to leave what we've been given, uh, what, we, what we've been given responsibility for. It's really up to us to make sure that we can pass that resource on. So stewardship is, is all of our responsibility. Uh, and Jerry just made that point. I really appreciated it. When it, the way we manage our pastures and our water resource, the way we, we manage the health and the gain in our calves, uh, making sure our, our cows get rebred for a subsequent year. All of that is about uh, responsible stewardship in terms of managing the resources we've been given. That, that's why I'm, again, pretty high on this idea of preconditioning calves. And, and I know, again, I didn't talk about the economics, uh, there's, there's a lot of good data out there on the economics and, and uh, just don't have enough time, should have shared that, but, but, but this, is, this is Clint Crable talking to the industry and, and to be honest, right, uh, admitting that I don't write a lot of checks. So I, I understand both sides of this argument, but before a calf leaves the home of origin, right, it ought to be vaccinated, it ought to be castrated and healed dehorned and healed, ideally weaned for at least 30 days, I'll say 30 to 45 days, and, uh, and training to a feed bunk, even if that's in a pasture, would be very, very beneficial for our industry. The results of that are obvious, right? We're gonna decrease cattle stress when we do ship those cattle, decrease shrink, we're gonna improve immune function, less reliance on medical acids and, and those that believe in ancillary therapies. Uh, we're gonna increase performance and carcass value, increase our marketing opportunities. And if we talk about, again, stewardship, maybe better than sustainability, uh, better opportunities for, for passing that resource on to the next generation.